Coming up on Tech News Today, Yahoo's reverse spinoff plan, Bitcoin's mastermind unmasked, and why gaming might be more important than voting. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, December 9th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Braintree. Looking to set up payments for your business? Braintree gives your app or website a payment solution that accepts just about every payment method with one simple integration. Plus, Braintree will give you the first $50,000 in transactions fee-free. To learn more, visit braintreepayments.com slash TNT. And by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID, but for your house. Right now, get free expedited FedEx shipping in time for the holidays when you go to ring.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. I am Megan Maroney, and Mike Elgin has decided to return to his feral, nomadic lifestyle. Those were his words, not mine. Uh, he will be writing and roaming the earth with his beautiful and talented wife. We will miss them both. But you will get to see Mike on our holiday specials that will run during the week between Christmas and New Year's. He will also be on This Week in Google today. And until then, I will be hosting the show. And then in January, Jason Howell and I will be back with a brand new Tech News Today. Our co-anchor today is ZDNet contributing writer Kevin Toffel. Welcome, Kevin. Hey, good to be here, Megan. How are you? I am good. How is your hoverboard? Has it burned down your house yet? <laughs> No, you know, the kids, uh, they stole my first hoverboard, so I had to get them each one for Christmas. And I've been reading all these stories about the uh, the electrical issues with them. And luckily, we haven't had any. Obviously, you wouldn't you wouldn't see my house because it would be gone. But uh, yeah, no, everything's good. Uh, I hope people took some advice if they were in the uh, market for these things. Oh, there's, that's me riding around my house on the bamboo floors. Uh, and, you know, the name brand ones are just super expensive. And the same companies make them all in China. Um I wonder about their quality control issues, considering all of the uh, the issues with these uh, electrical problems. In fact, I think the port uh, port in UK uh, banned these things from coming in. Fifteen thousand of them for that reason. So yeah, I haven't not, heard of anyone good. banning them in the U.S. or uh, any. But I mm. think there have been like a lot of fires. But you say yours have been safe so far. Mine are okay, but I'll be honest. I don't plug them in overnight and just walk away and go back to bed because I'm concerned. You know, I, I want to let it charge and see if there's a problem. Uh, luckily, there hasn't been. That's smart. Well, you've been busy with a lot of content, some Google and Android content, which will balance out my bent toward Apple. Uh, we'll talk about a lot of that on the show. Uh, let's get to the top news during the morning show and the evening show. Doing both of them is great. Uh, it's exhausting. But in the evenings, I also get to report the rumors. And then in the morning, I get to report the same stories, but now they're news. Uh, Yahoo said today that it has officially scrapped plans to spin off the Chinese e-commerce company Alibaba. Instead, uh, one of the last remaining old school internet companies will sell off its core business instead, including its stake in Yahoo Japan, maybe even with a new name that someone didn't come up with in his college dorm room. Uh, what do you think about this news, Kevin? Well, it's kind of sad to see. Um, I totally understand why Yahoo is not spinning off its um, uh, Alibaba stake. And that's because they were not sure about the potential billions in taxes that could be passed on to the shareholders and so on. Um, I just, you know, I think back to the late 90s and I was using Yahoo before Google. It, Yahoo was the thing. And now the entire value of Yahoo is not Yahoo at all. It's what it owns in Alibaba and it's Yahoo Japan. So it's like a, a you know, a, a company that was a pioneer and it's just lost its way and may not be around much longer. I mean, that's just a guess on my part. I don't know anything, but it's just sad to see. Yeah, it's interesting. They're calling it a reverse spin-off plan, which I was like the reverse of spin-off, mm -hmm. spin-in. I guess the core is spinning out. That I guess that's what they mean by the reverse spin-off. The, the bigger part is is leaving. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, What's it's, interesting is, I mean, it, it's just for tax purposes, right? I mean, that's why they're doing this. Yeah, correct. That that was the big thing. Um, they had said since they couldn't get a guarantee from the IRS that they wouldn't you know, have to pay all kinds of taxes. Uh, they just said, no, we're not going to do this because the shareholders are not too keen on it. Uh, their core internet business is actually being talked about being purchased by AT&T and or Verizon, which, you know, could give new life to Yahoo's core internet business. But, you know, those two companies are going to have to figure out if it makes sense for them. And I'm not I'm not so sure it does. 
but we'll see. Yeah, so the core uh, business is their web properties, search, email, media, advertising. I'm assuming media is, is things like Tumblr and Flickr, uh, which, I mean, are popular, uh, are not as popular as they used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I don't know what kind of revenues those are generating for the company either. I haven't looked at their financials in ages. I'm just, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm a, I'm a gadget guy. So yesterday, uh, right before the show started, uh, Google lifted the, the ban on reviews for the Chromebook Pixel C. Uh, so everyone who had one uh, was able to do the review. Uh, you have had yours for a few days. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, Google loaned me the, the uh, Pixel C. It's right here with its beautiful screen. Um, it's a nice 10.2 inch tablet. They also sent me the optional keyboard, which I really do like the, the hinge mechanism on it. You just attach the, the device to the keyboard and, and boom, you, you've got a little, little mini laptop, so to speak. Um, since I've only used it for a few days and I shy away from giving full reviews of devices until I've actually lived with them for a week, I shared impressions yesterday. Overall, the hardware is fantastic in my opinion, and I, I haven't read anybody saying otherwise, but there's a common theme that I saw as well as other people in their reviews, and that is on the software side, Android apps are still a bit of a letdown. So you've got this really nice hardware, beautiful high resolution screen. Um, it's not a cheap tablet by any means, it's $499 to start and $150 for the keyboard. And you get a great piece of hardware, but what can you do with it? It really comes down to the software. And it's interesting that this is the Pixel, not a Nexus. This is the Pixel. And I've used the Chromebook Pixels. And there was when those came out, there was nothing that could touch those devices. They, when you got a quote unquote Pixel experience, top notch Chrome OS experience. This, I'm not getting a Pixel experience because there are other Android tablets that are pretty comparable. And again, the software just seems like a li little bit of a letdown. Yeah, I think yesterday when I, I talked about it, I think I said that it was a Chromebook. Um, uh, no one corrected hmm. me, so maybe I didn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> but it's definitely running Android. Um, but mm -hmm. I mean, in 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 the sense, does that really matter? I mean, I think you know they've talked about Chromebook um, be, Chrome becoming Android one in one in the same. Uh, but you know, typical Google, they kind of go back and forth about um, when they're going to do that. Uh, but does it feel like when you know? When you talk about like something like the iPad Pro versus the mm -hmm. MacBook, I mean, that is a definitely a different uh, operating system. One, uh, you can definitely see as a productivity device. The other one, I think we're all really trying to convince ourselves that it's a productivity device. Uh, but with Chrome, with Chrome versus Android, is there really that big of a difference? Well, there are differences. I mean, I, I've used Chromebooks full time for a couple of years. Um, I'm actually using an iPad Pro right now full time. I have been for three weeks. Um, my computing requirements are pretty meager compared to a lot of other people, so I can do that. Uh, Chrome gives you that, that full desktop experience on the browser. There are a few apps that are Android apps that run on Chrome. There are plenty of great uh, web apps that do run on, on Chrome as well. Um, most Chromebooks are larger than this Pixel C as well. So I feel more productive with Chrome. I miss out on the app side. Here with the Pixel C, I don't feel as productive. It's a little bit of a cramped experience. It's a small keyboard. Um, there are, I would say, very few still Android apps that are optimized for tablets, especially when it comes to productivity. You've got your basics with Google, you know, Docs and Sheets and stuff, and uh, you also have Microsoft Office products. But after that, it goes downhill kind of quick. I mean, just for example, not that Twitter is a productivity tool, but using Twitter on the Pixel C, I can only see between three and six tweets on the screen at any one given time. And it's like, I can see more on my phone practically. So what's, what is this intended to be? Google seems to position it as a productivity device, but I don't see the software really supporting that. Right, and it's about uh, $650 total with the keyboard and the, uh, and, and, the, and the Chromebook, or the Pixel C itself, right? Six Correct. Six fifty. Mm -hmm. So let's move on. Uh, here's an update to a story I talked about last night that again was a rumor, but maybe now is actual news. Uh, Wired All But Unmasked, the mysterious creator of Bitcoin, who goes by the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, through blog posts, encrypted conversations, leaked documents, a Wired reporter Andy Greenberg said an un, that, he, that an unknown eccentric Australian tech entrepreneur named Craig Stephen Wright is probably created Bitcoin and probably was ready to be found, probably because we had all lost interest in find, trying to find out who he was. Uh, have you been following this this morning? I have a little bit. And it's funny because just yesterday I was setting up a Raspberry Pi and a, a Bitcoin miner just for fun to you know, 
crank through and, and earn some Bitcoins. It's not worth the time and effort, but it's a fun project. Um, so ironically, this news just broke last night as a rumor, and now it seems to be or probably is accurate. Um, I personally, I don't see what the big manhunt was all about. I don't think Bitcoin's not going to change because we may have found out who developed it. It might be interesting to hear his thoughts on it, but there are so many papers and research on, on how it all works that I don't know if we'd learn anything new about it. Right. I mean, they say it might have been also created by Dave Kleiman. He uh, is deceased now. He was a computer forensics expert uh, and and a friend of, of Craig Stephen Wright. Um, and Australian police say that they, they have raided uh, his house today, uh, but that was not related to the Bitcoin claim. Bitcoin claim. Uh, they were assisting the Australian taxation office. I don't know if that means, it, you know, he didn't pay his taxes or, or what. It's awful coincidental, though. It is. Mm. <laughs> Uh, some other news that, that just broke this morning, Cortana is coming to iOS and Android. Cortana, of course, uh, is the Siri or OK Google uh, uh, personal assistant for Microsoft. Uh, and now you can you could use it on Windows Phone. Uh, not that many people use Windows Phone. So now the app is coming to iOS and Android. I checked the App Store this morning, the iOS uh, App Store, and I couldn't find it yet. Uh, have you been able to install it yet this morning? Uh, it's on my to-do list to put on both Android and iOS devices today. Um, personally, I, I actually do like uh, Cortana. I have an old Windows phone that I still use from time to time for testing. I find it to be much better than Siri, um, and I would say comparable to Google now, which I'm, I'm a little partial to. Uh, Microsoft, uh, they've done a, a wonderful job in, in adding contextual smarts to Cortana. And now, obviously, they've been doing this for some time under Satya Nadella, their CEO, moving their apps and services to other platforms. I think it's one of the smartest things they can do. So I'll be downloading it later today. Me too. This episode is brought to you by Braintree, code for easy mobile payments. Maybe you're working on the next Uber, Airbnb, or GitHub, then why not use the same simple payment solution that helped them become what they are today? Braintree makes mobile payments easy and seamless with just a few lines of code. You're instantly ready to accept Apple Pay, Android Pay, PayPal, Venmo, credit cards, even Bitcoin. Braintree is on the cutting edge of e-commerce, helping companies convert visitors into customers. Have you heard of contextual commerce? We spoke to the general manager for Braintree Mobile about the next big thing for online retailers. Contextual commerce is bringing the buying experience inside of a news feed or a consumer platform and not requiring the consumer to have to click away to a merchant's website to complete a purchase. So it's really taking all of the really good demographic data and allowing consumers to buy where they're comfortable discovering things. So the same way that consumers love to do a one-click buying experience with Uber, Airbnb, they're going to want to do that experience with some of these big consumer platforms that they're highly engaged with. No matter what you are selling, Braintree's fast payouts and continuous support mean you'll always be ready, whether you're earning your first dollar or your billionth. See fewer abandoned carts and more sales with Braintree's best-in-class mobile checkout experience. Braintree gives you a full-stack payment solution, support for all payment types your customers might want, single integration across all platforms with superior fraud protection, customer service, and fast payouts. To check it out for yourself, visit braintreepayments.com slash TNT. The HTC Vive, a virtual reality collaboration between HTC and Valve, was announced back in March and promised by the end of 2015. Now HTC has officially delayed the Vive VR system until April 2016. Joining us to talk about this is Sam Moscovich from Ars Technica. Welcome, Sam. Good morning. How's it, how's it going? How's it going? It's, go it's going well. Did you get your coffee? I got my coffee, but okay. I'll try and be uh, smooth at any rate. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, uh, the news the news came down the pipeline, uh, tucked into the end of a very nice sounding announcement about all kinds of great HTC Vive things, just tucked in April 2016, just hidden at the very end. In fact, uh, HTC site went down when the announcement went out. If uh, if that isn't a, a good hint of the kind of uh, fanfare they wanted us to uh, see with that announcement. So let's talk a little bit about the HTC Vive. Uh, what makes it different than and than what's already out there for consumers? Yeah, it's it's interesting because both there's a lot of companies and there's not much actually for sale right now. If you want to do virtual reality right now, you can go and get a Samsung Gear VR at a store where you take the headset that's a hundred bucks, slap a, a Samsung a compatible uh, phone or mini tablet uh, into it like a Pop Tart, and then boom, you have a a uh, decent VR rig. Uh, otherwise, there's cardboard where you just take the little $10 piece of cardboard and stick your own phone into it, an iPhone or any other. And those are both very uh, not great virtual reality 
uh, situations. They're, they're decent. They give you sort of a sense that you are in another place while you're sitting down. Um, the HTC Vive was really the real shaker in the whole uh, s system of, of stuff coming out, including Oculus. Most of these have been sit-down systems. HTC wanted you to kick the chair out. You could walk around a room while wearing a headset. Uh, and in, in case you were worried about bumping into walls, it's designed to specifically show you where your real life walls are. So you have, you know, uh, eight feet by eight feet, a box to sort of walk around and manipulate. You can paint, you can play with random toys in a virtual space. So that's what made it different was this ability to get up because people had complained so much about virtual reality sickness. And this one says, well, if you can move and you feel like you're in a real place, then you don't get sick. That's what really blew us away back when we first saw it in March. And we've been impressed ever since. Sam, you know, there's a couple of different products like this. You mentioned some of them. I use cardboard at home. Oculus is coming out. You've got the the Samsung VR. You've got Microsoft HoloLens, which is a little bit different, but still in this space. And that's going to cost, I think, three thousand dollars for a developer kit. So what's being delayed here is actually the developer kits, if I'm not mistaken. And is that correct? And if so, um, do we even know how much those are or were going to cost? The developer kits have been going out since March. And they've continued going out, and they're actually going to. The announcement today, uh, yesterday, was that seven thousand more developer for, wow, developer kits were going out for free. Uh, HTC and Valve are not charging for those. They want developers to have these and create content. Uh, this was specifically for the go online or to a store and order your own retail kit for the home as a fan. Uh, that was the promise had been first that it was going to be out for retail by the end of the year. Um, a few months ago, they revised that to say a limited launch would be by the end of this year uh, so that, you know, a few enthusiasts would be able to buy their own consumer versions. And now uh, the news is consumer version. No way can you get it this year. You'll have to wait till April. Uh, in fact, there's going to be a HTC conference, I believe, December 18th. Uh, that's going to be talking a lot about Maybe they'll have a specific price. Maybe they'll have a specific release date. We really don't know. But something is going to happen on December 18th in HTC's home turf. So is that rare that they give away the developer kits? I mean, the HoloLens developer kit is not free, right? right. Yeah, this is a very ambitious push by Valve and HTC. They really want not only content, but content that you could only do on their platform. Um, Oculus and other systems are beginning to experiment with this whole get up and move around kind of VR. Uh, I was just at a Sony conference and their PlayStation VR, which is set for the first half of next year, uh, has some limited get up, walk around stuff. But its tracking system is clearly designed for you to sit down. Oculus has its own uh, extra add-on called Touch, which also lets you get up, but that also doesn't really have a release date. It's sort of wonky out there. HTC and Valve really are the ones who are saying, get up, move around, that is the best version of virtual reality. Uh, and so that kind of giveaway of 7,000 dev kits is pretty intense. Uh, and considering how HTC is doing lately, they need this to be big. Uh, the middle of this year, their stock really tanked. The M9 was disappointing. Uh, the HTC One A9 handset is, didn't really impress us that much more. Uh, they're not doing great. And their stock dipped a little bit today, not as much as it had in the past. But, you know, they really need a huge only HTC product. They've been too much of a Me Too Android maker for a long time. So they need this. Sam, that actually leads into something I wanted to ask you about, and it's strictly your opinion. Do you think this thing will actually come to market? And the only reason I say that is because some of the things you had just mentioned, HTC has really had a tough time in the smartphone market. Um, they had wearables last year that they had planned, and they canceled those, and now they're talking about maybe they'll have some new ones at CES next month. Um, you know, they've had a string of poor performing products, sales are down, and some products that never even made it to market. So do you really think at this point this will even come to market? I honestly couldn't tell you. It's really a, a matter of how much money they can pledge to a giant consumer product launch. I mean, essentially, they're making a, a big cell phone that's wrapped in a different plastic wrapper because you're using essentially cell phone screen technology and accelerometers and these extra little laser tracking boxes that you stick in the corners of your virtual reality room. So in terms of a manufacturing standpoint, they could make it. But if anyone decides to really pull the plug and say, this is going to tank, this is not going to make us money, people aren't ready for virtual reality, anything could make the company skittish at this point. Uh, I, I hope beyond hope that it does come out, but I 
I have also seen Valve's latest uh, attempts at hardware when they make it themselves. Uh, they made a controller and they made a streaming box that came out last month. Valve needs a major hardware company. They they made their own thing. It wasn't as good as something that a, a hardware pro like HTC can make. So if HTC fumbles the ball, this is going to fall totally apart. So it seems like uh, products get delayed all the time, uh, but with VR, it really is more important because they're, they're all, all of us are really saying like, is this just gonna be hype or is it really going to come out? Uh, that is a big question. You've been to Valve, you've seen their headquarters. Um, so so you don't uh, have any guesses as to whether you really, we're really gonna see this based on what you saw when you, we talked, you talked to people there. Uh, it's, a, it's honestly, there's, Valve never responds to emails unless they have very good news. Uh, they've yet to comment on HTC's delay. Um, but what's really interesting is that Oculus, which is owned by Facebook, their product is scheduled for Q1 of next year. They've been really sticking to that. Uh, Sony's PlayStation VR, which actually as a sit down product is pretty impressive. That's still aiming for the first half of next year. Uh, this was, if they, if HTC and Valve had beaten everybody to the punch by getting something out by the end of this month for consumers, that would have been a huge win. That would have probably been the thing to send HTC stock and confidence rising, they blew that. So it's it's really, a, it, something is gonna come out for decent virtual reality. Mark Zuckerberg put way too much money into uh, Oculus for that to not happen. So at the very least, we will get something, we will get the kind of virtual reality experience that blew us away when we went to Valve, that's blown us away at conferences. It's gonna come, it may be way too expensive, it may be too soon, but at least it'll be out. And so we heard that Magic Leap also, that, that's the sort of outlier company. I think Google's invested in them. They, they got us a round of funding uh, today. Uh, what do you think of them? I've used some different Magic Leap stuff, not as much. They've been going in a very different direction. Um, the gaming conferences tend to be loaded with virtual reality because there's such an obvious um, overlap of 3D content that's being made for virtual reality. Um, it, Magic Leap is going to have to really push hard at this year's CES to get a lot of attention, to make people look at it and go, okay, the educational possibilities, the entertainment possibilities, where's this going to land? Who's going to buy it? Is it going to be uh, institutional? Is it going to be commercial? Uh, that mission statement hasn't been clear. They haven't done a great job of getting that uh, information out to the market. Um, but you know, uh, once once people are using these products, that's really all that matters. If you can get a killer app like Tilt Brush for the um, HTC Vive, uh, that alone will will really really push the momentum. In fact, that was the thing I think that really convinced a lot of my um, uh, peers that the HTC Vive was something real. There was a Disney animator who grabbed an HTC Vive, grabbed the two wands, and just started painting characters from Disney cartoons uh, instantly. Uh, his ability to do that so quickly in a video, I think, was really the selling point. And the more of these events and the more of these showcases come out and the more killer apps there are, uh, the more we'll know which of these products is really going to find that right balance between being really cool and being affordable. Well, Sam Moscovich is the culture reporter at Ars Technica. He is at Sam Red on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Megan. Talk to you soon. Take care. And in self-driving car news, the Wall Street Journal reports that Samsung might be getting into the self-driving car business. Uh, they want to make the parts. This is the company's first official announcement. They did have a series of patent filings back in 2013, implied interest that was in making technology for electric vehicles. Uh, what do you think about uh, Samsung making parts for robot cars, Kevin? Well, I could say that, hey, Apple's doing it, so of course Samsung's going to do it too, but I won't go there. Uh, instead, I'll say I think it's a smart move by Samsung because even though they are the smartphone leader by selling the most smartphones uh, around the world, you know they don't make a ton of profit anymore on those phones. So they are heavy into the chip business, the screen business, uh, wireless modems, all the things that, you know, the components in smartphones. A lot of these same components can be reused in smart cars, and Samsung actually does make a good chunk of money off of the components that it makes. So I think it's a, a smart move uh, because there's a certain tie-in between the smartphone technology, the mobile connected world and cars of the future. So good move on their part, I think. Yeah, I think they'll start with in-car entertainment, satellite navigation, autonomous driving technologies, and I guess we'll see where they go from there. And in corn cord cutter news, Apple isn't getting into the live TV business anytime soon, according to the, a comment from CBS Corp. Chief Executive Officer Les Moonves. Moonves says Apple has put live TV plans on hold, at least for the immediate future. Uh, were you counting on live Apple TV? Kevin? Uh, I could see it happen, uh, but it, it comes down to the challenges of, of um, 
negotiating with the with the carriers or I'm sorry with the um, content providers and that looks to be the the struggle right now um, Apple usually has a lot of clout in these types of industries but I guess not enough yet for uh, live TV streaming it's interesting and last night on Tech News tonight I talked about Amazon's uh, new plan the streaming partners program uh, where you can pay for channels individually you have to be a prime subscriber but it's not like other prime programs where you get them free you have to pay but you can pay individually. Uh, it's really interesting. I mean, this is just sort of broke open the whole idea of, you know, what cable can be, what, you know, what watching media can be. Uh, so are, are you a cord cutter or do you still have uh, regular TV? Uh, we still have, uh, I have Verizon Fios, mainly though the family uses that. And I tend to use either an Apple TV, a Fire TV, my Xbox, or actually um, over the air HD from my local channels here near Philadelphia. Um, most of the stuff I watch is just available for free or online. So, you know, I'd say one out of four of us in the family are cord cutters. Uh, so let's switch gears to another article that you wrote uh, about Focus for Firefox. Uh, Focus is an iOS content blocker from Mozilla. Uh, it's free for Safari users on iOS 9. Uh, what makes Focus different than the rest of the content blockers out there? Yeah, there, there are a lot of content blockers out there and they all came about with iOS 9 support for these these blockers that literally they, they strip out a lot of the things that track you on the web when you're in mobile Safari and you're going to websites. Um, so they speed the process up of actually getting to the content you want. What's different here is Mozilla said, you know, we don't know how all of these other blockers actually keep their lists. You know, companies can pay to be on a list or off a list, to be blocked or not be blocked. We're going to go, and of course, in, in historical fashion, we're going to go it with an open source method. Um, so basically, there's a public list of sites that are on the block list. You can uh, view it at any time. Uh, companies cannot pay to be on it or off of it. There's even a process that if a company thinks it shouldn't be on there in a very transparent way, you, they can file and, and be reviewed and be off the list. So it's Mozilla's open source twist on the content blocking. So it's always surprising to me that that's the way uh, ad blockers and content blockers work. That in, that that instead of saying uh, a company saying what can I do to make my uh, ad more palatable to not slow everything down, uh, th they don't ask that. They just say uh, how much money do you have and hand it over. Yeah, it's it's a very numbers driven uh, business. I mean, I, I you know being a writer in it for the past ten years, I've seen the numbers and and dealt with it myself, and it's a pain from a reader experience when you're browsing the web. I hate them those ads and things just as much as everybody else. But you know, it makes sense to some degree because again, it does speed up the mobile web for you. Um, and also, uh, it gives you more control over over what data is actually being collected at the time. <laughs> so a very important thing in this day and age, you know, as far as uh, data privacy. I mean, I really like the idea of focus. I mean, they're not if an ad is not tracking you or uh, then it, then it won't be blocked. So that that's why it's called a, like a content blocker. it's it's blocking content that's tracking you, right? That's correct. Um, and in fact, Mozilla says that companies that adhere to uh, users do not track preferences. If I say do not track me and a company says we support that, we will not track you based on this flat flag or setting on your device, they, they won't be blocked actually because they are, you know, at least going meeting the users halfway on that. So I like the approach that Mozilla has taken here. It's not an all or nothing kind of thing. And it's again, it's a very open and transparent process and discussion on, you know, what's a blocker or what should be blocked and what shouldn't. So you use one blocker uh, on mm -hmm. iOS. Uh, do you think you'll switch to Focus? Yeah, I think I will. I mean, if, if nothing else, it's just to support Mozilla, which has had a tough time. I mean, um, they, they've, they've tried a lot of different things in the mobile space and, and some have been great and some just haven't worked. And some are, not to you know reuse the word, but some have been blocked. I mean, you can't even use Focus on iOS if you're using the Firefox browser because iOS doesn't allow content blockers for third-party browsers. So, you know, Mozilla's had a tough time. So just to support them, I, I have it installed and I'll probably use it for a while. I love Mozilla. I have always loved them. They're that little, little company that could. I mean, they just keep yep. doing things. And it's so funny that they're they were named after Godzilla, which is like that is they're so not Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. A I, bunch of folks. I think they probably would have given up that name at some point if they had become a Google or something because they wouldn't be wanting to be seen that way. But they're still just, uh, you know, trying to help the little guy. Uh, and there, there was some other news, some not so great news from Mozilla. They're giving up on Firefox OS, uh, the phones that were running Firefox. Uh, did you? I know you wrote about these back in the day. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you ever use one? Did you ever own one? I did. I, I had a review unit. Um, 
And and this is another thing where I hate to see, you know, a good idea go bad, but unfortunately that's kind of what happened here. Uh, It's a matter of timing. Firefox OS is all web-based, so there wasn't a big app store and that, you know, app stores brought the rise of the smartphone. And in this day and age, you already have very low cost Windows phones, Android phones that can be had for, you know, $50. And that's the segment that Mozilla was targeting here, emerging markets and uh, it's it's just a shame to see, but um, good idea. Just it just took too long to get implemented. Well, I'm I'm sad to see it it go, even though I never yeah. used one. <laughs> and this episode is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. The Ring Video Doorbell lets you see and speak to anyone at your door from anywhere, just using your smartphone. But it's more than just stopping would-be burglars in their tracks this time of year. You are probably getting packages sent to the house for the holidays. With Ring, you can talk to delivery people and keep an eye on your package. If someone tries to mess with it, you'll get an instant alert and an HD video of the whole thing. It's like having a neighbor keep an eye on your home 24-7, but without the judgment. Installing Ring takes minutes, and it works with either your current wiring or built-in rechargeable battery. This year, give the gift of peace of mind and convenience with a video doorbell Time Magazine named one of their top 10 gadgets. Go to ring.com slash TNT and you will get free expedited FedEx shipping. That's ring.com slash TNT. With Ring, you are always home. And finally tonight, what happens when girls get kicked out of a gaming conference? They create their own. At least that's what happened in Saudi Arabia, in a country where women will be able to vote in municipal elections for the first time in history this Saturday. They're also showing up in hordes to a gaming conference that has already been around for four years. NPR reports on GCon, an annual gaming conference that started in Riyadh in 2011, after women were banned from an all-male gaming convention. And for the first time, the conference has expanded to Kobar in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. Uh, NPR says there's a huge market for gaming and for social media among Saudi females. Uh, It's still a very young country, very conservative. The fastest growing segment of the population is under 30 years old, and girls or women are going online and gaming as a way to express themselves. Uh, Have you heard of this, Kevin? I haven't heard about it, but I think this is fantastic. I mean, um, you know, it's a shame from my perspective here as as a, you know, a cultural American that, you know, we see the, the females in certain countries don't have, you know, the abilities to do things or whatever. And you know what? Good for them saying, we're not going to take this line down. We're going to have our own gaming conference and we're going to make it happen. They've been doing it for four years. As you said, they're going to be um, voting as well for the first time this weekend. It's fantastic news. I think it's great. I mean, I I listened to the report on NPR this morning. It's great to hear uh, these girls and women's voices. I mean, they're doing cosplay. Uh, They're they're really excited. And they're they're talking about, yes, uh, they're getting the vote, but it moves so slow. And it was interesting, Mm -hmm. just the question of uh, this, like this, like gaming and expressing yourself online might be more important, like might be a more important sign of change than voting, which is, is fascinating because it's change that they can make themselves. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. It's fantastic. Well, Kevin, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Our TNT fan of the day is everyone who emailed and tweeted and Google Plus and Facebook thumbs up to wish Jason and Howell, Jason Howell and I good luck and to tell Mike Elgin how much they appreciated his hard work and his professionalism on the show. Uh, you know who you are and thank you. Uh, you can show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter or Facebook. You can use the hashtag, hashtag how I watch TNT. We will find it. Uh, let us know what you'd like to see in the new tech news today in 2016. Jason and I have some big plans already. We want to know uh, what you want to see and hear about. Kevin Tofel, thank you so much for joining us. We talked about a few of your articles on ZDNet. Uh, you also just posted something this morning about a fix for the iPad Pro. Yes, uh, it may fix the problem. Some iPad Pros were freezing up after being recharged. I did not personally have this problem, but iOS 9.2, which Apple made available just yesterday, if you download and install that, Apple says it, quote, may fix the issue. So that's not a vote of confidence there that they figured it out, but it's worth uh, it's worth a try. What else are you working on? I think I'm going to spend the rest of this week uh, looking at this Chromebook Pixel. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Pixel C a little bit more. Again, it's probably not ideal for me, but I want to make sure that people who are interested in it know all the pros and cons before they go out and buy one. Well, you can read uh, Kevin's first impressions right now on ZDNet. Uh, he is also ke- at Kevin C. Tofel on Twitter. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. And Mike Elgin, as I said, uh, will be on This Week in Google today, so stick around for that. And as for this show, show, you can subscribe to Tech News Today on Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, TuneIn, RSS. 
You have so many options. You can choose your favorite way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1700 UTC at twit.tv slash live. If you are ever in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can come in and watch us as part of our studio audience. To do that, just send an email to tickets at twit.tv. You can follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Also, don't miss our other news show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every week. I will be there. I hope you will be there, too. And that is the Tech News Today. This show was produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Megan Maroney. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. You can...